evening, Newcastle. I have come all the way from Aberdeen to talk to you. I go a long way to, uh, to, to disseminate the German culture that I work on. Um, uh, yes, I come from Aberdeen. It's a city famous for its seagull nests and for its uh, sea views. But if you want a sea view in Aberdeen, you've got to live in one of these. Uh, um, because the Aberdonians, they don't really go in for the romantic stuff. They know the price of oil. And they know it's value, but they don't really care about the romantic side to the world. And that's why it's really nice here to be in the northeast, to have come down. And uh, you have all these wonderful romantic castles in this region. Um, uh, although many of them are ruined, I'm thinking here in particular of the Stadium of Light and uh, <laughs> much of Middlesbrough. Uh, yes, uh, I normally talk about Dundee, but uh, I'm in the wrong place for that tonight. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm here to talk about my research, which is on, as John said, on German ruins, um, the culture of ruins in Germany. And I've been working on this for quite a while. And my qualification comes because I worked, uh, I did a PhD on German and history at the University of Oxford. Uh, never mind. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so that's where I first came across uh, Julian. Um, at a lecture. At this lecture were the fresh-faced future comedian Stuart Lee, before he'd let himself go to rack and ruin. Yes. Uh, and also the future housing minister Jeremy Hunt, <laughs> um, having destroyed the NHS and the media will doubtless be given another bit of the social fabric of Britain to destroy very soon. And also the future British Prime Minister, uh, Boris Johnson. <laughs> David Cameron should have been there, but it was the Bullington Club's day trip down to Cowley, where they went to investigate the council housing there and come up with their future plans for the bedroom tax. <laughs> but enough political satire. I'm here to talk about my research. And my research, I say, is about German ruins. And I came across this at a lecture in Oxford many, many years ago when I was much younger, not the ruin I am now. And it was a lecture about architectural policy in the Third Reich. <laughs> oh dear, here we go. Now, this is just today. This is just today. The Daily Mail is the bane of my life. I go around trying to get people to understand the complexity of German culture, and then bloody November comes around, everyone's got a bloody moustache, and it's Hitler time. Oh, God. So there's the latest one. Poor old dog. And of course, what I hate about this is it constructs this idea of cute animals and Hitler as the embodiment of pure evil. But it wasn't Hitler alone, and that was the purpose, really, of this lecture that I went to, was it wasn't just Hitler who was responsible for architectural policy, it was Albert Speer. Anybody heard of Albert Speer? Anybody remember him? He won't remember you. That's, his memoirs are even more reliable than mine. Anyway, Speer was Hitler's architect, and he didn't design this house, as you can probably tell. But he planned Germania, which was to be the German monumental capital that was to replace Hitler's um, detested socialist city of Berlin. Um, so, yeah. uh, now, the interesting thing about uh, Speer's plan for Germania was that it was a vision of the future, but it was very much based on the past. Speer designed it with the idea of what it would look like as a ruin after the end of the Thousand Year Reich, which was, of course, something of an overestimate in the end. <laughs> anyway, Speer's, uh, um, Speer's plan were involved, obviously, a lot of demolition, but during the war, Speer was rather busy doing other stuff, so he had to outsource it all to Bomber Command, who did something <laughs> too soon. Um, so, so uh, they did a fairly good job of reducing most of the German cities to rubble. Now, uh, by the end of the war then, uh, Germany looked pretty much as Speer had imagined it, except, of course, the Germans were either too dead or too hungry to actually admire the beauty of the ruins they had uh, been left with. So, uh, and then now we move to the positive bit of the talk, which is about German reconstruction, the economic miracle, and the construction of new housing. Because the vision of the future for German cities was one which you've experienced here too in Newcastle, I think we had mentioned a biker already, which was the construction of new housing which took people out of the slums they lived in and moved them into better, lighter, more airy houses. Um, now, when they did this, this was obviously based on uh, the principle that there would be limitless capitalist growth, and that was obviously something of an overestimate as well. No. But when, um, so they went through this, but they forgot two key things when they were doing this. First of all, you can reform social housing, but unless you redistribute wealth 
and actually change the economic structure, you just actually reinscribe social in 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 inequality wherever you go. Uh, in, this, in a different place. Now, obviously, if that doesn't work, you can still bring in the bedroom tax and uh, make the poor stay where they are, whatever happens. So, that was the first thing they forgot. The second thing they forgot was place. That we hope houses are, how are not just houses, they are homes. We connect them with the neighbourhood, with community, and the new houses that have been built weren't really suitable or fit for purpose for that. So, in the late 60s, the Germans turned back to the past. They also turned back to thinking about the German past as we think of the German past, um, which they've done a good job of not mentioning for 20 years or so <laughs> in preparation for a faulty towers episode. So, uh, how, all, all, German, all German culture basically is based around the chance for British to make fun of them, I figure. Um, uh, so they went, returned to the ruins, demolition was out, renovation was back in, uh, renovation of the old. But the Germans, as they always do, they did this in a very thorough fashion. So the Germans have become kind of hoarders. Um, and they've very, very rarely throw anything away. There's this image of the Berlin Wall, as it currently stands in the middle of Berlin, uh, would look. Oh, no, that's not the Berlin Wall. Um, that, this is actually uh, a painting by Caspar David Friedrich, so you've really learned something today, the romantic painter of the early 19th century, who actually set the sort of uh, cultural framework within which Speer then developed his iconography of ruined value. Now, I suppose at the heart of my research is the question, why are we so attracted to ruins? Why do we love the sweets we ate in the 1970s? I look around, or 1980s and 1990s. Why do we love the sweets we ate in the 1970s or 80s? Why do we love the perpetual renewal of the joke about Stuart Lee's ruination? Why do we love this? We love this because it gives us a sense of age and the only end of age. It connects us with time and the passing of time, something which progress and the modern world has caused us to forget. Now, um, so we're comforted by this. We're comforted, as you I'm sure are aware, by Downton Abbey. We're comforted by the fact that Bruce Forsyth is apparently still alive. <laughs> Indeed. Um, but be comforted because if Gove, Hunt, I said it right, Osborne, <laughs> if these boys remain in charge for much longer, we'll all be living in the 19th century again, with heritage work uh, houses and uh, debtors prisons. So, but we'll be all right, because we are all consumers of the past now. As long as our period detail is correct and our neighborhood value and property value remain static, we will be very happy. Um, I have been Simon Ward. I am now a lot older than I was when I started this. My thousand years are now over, so I'll leave you with one thought. May God go with you as you age. Thank you.